Today's talking about radioactivity, which is one type of nuclear reaction, one way in which a nucleus can transform into another nucleus. Today we're going to talk about two more types of nuclear reactions, like radioactivity can transform a nucleus into something else, but these aren't com necessarily completely natural, completely spontaneous, completely random processes like radioactivity are. We're going to talk today about nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Both of which we often associate with bombs, with weapons, like we see here, but can be applied in other situations as well. It's not just bad um, that we're dealing with nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Let's define fission first. Uh, how many people take biology or have taken bio 30 years? And quite a few more of you guys than, than we're in the other class. If you take biology, you, you remember something about mitosis, right? Mitosis is what? Yeah, it's cell division, right? Uh, versus meiosis, which is sex cell division. Mitosis is regular cell division, right? Uh, sometimes mitosis is also called cellular fission. Have you ever heard that? Cellular fission? Mitosis or cellular fission, whatever you want to call it, is the dividing of a cell from one cell into two. One cell becomes two. Two cells become four. Four cells become eight. And so on and so on and so on. The word fission means dividing. So cellular fission is the dividing of a cell. Nuclear fission is the dividing of a nucleus. Nuclear fission is when one heavy nucleus becomes two or more, it could theoretically be more, lighter nuclei. Now if you take a look at this equation that I have written out for you here right now, uh, one zero neutron plus uranium-235 goes to krypton and so on and so on and so on. Look at the nuclei involved here. Forget about the, the neutrons here and the energy there and so on right now. Those are important. But just look at the nuclei themselves right now. On the left-hand side, we have uranium-235. That's one heavy nucleus. And on the right-hand side, we have krypton-92 and barium-141. That's two. They're still fairly heavy, but they're lighter nuclei. One heavy nucleus becomes two lighter nuclei. Now, there are neutrons which are important on both sides of the mix, and there's energy which is also important, but not in determining what type of reaction it is. The type of reaction, the fission reaction, is just determined by the virtue of the fact that we have one nucleus splitting up into two or more lighter nuclei. Now, those neutrons are important to describe why this fission reaction happens, why it splits up like it does. Uranium-235 is, is what we call a fissionable material. If it combines with a neutron in the right way, then it actually becomes uranium-236 for a very brief moment in time. And then it decays into this krypton and barium. So if we want it to decay into krypton and barium, what we do is bombard it with a neutron. We bombard this uranium with this neutron right here. And again, it combines for a short period of time, and then it decays into krypton and barium. It also releases some energy. Can we talk about a nuclear power plant? They're all nuclear fission power plants. In different countries, the design is different, the technology is different, but the basic physics is the same. One heavy nucleus splits into two or more lighter nuclei, generates energy, boils water with that energy, that heat that's produced, um, turns the water into steam, steam rises, turns a turbine, moves a magnet relative to a wire, and generates electricity. The energy, however, that comes out of this reaction, this particular reaction, isn't enough to power a city, or to blow up a city for that matter. It's enough maybe to move a speck of dust. It's a very, very small amount of energy. Which is like in a chemical reaction, we don't usually look at a single reaction. We look at multiple reactions that are taking place. Well, how do we get multiple reactions taking place here? We can fire a neutron at uranium 235, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. But if in each of these reactions, it only generates enough energy to move a speck of dust, you're going to use more energy up in firing neutrons at the uranium than you're going to get out of it. So that's not very useful. But as it, as it works out here, 
In this fission reaction, we also get three neutrons produced. Take a look at the left-hand side for a second. 1 plus 235 is 236. 0 plus 92 is 92. Right here with the krypton and barium, 92 plus 141 is 233. 36 plus 56 is 92. We're missing something on the right-hand side, right? 92, 92, 236, 233. We're missing three neutrons. So those three neutrons need to be produced here in order to make sure that this thing, this, this all balances out. But as it turns out, those three neutrons can, if the design of this is right, the vessel in which this is contained is right, then these three neutrons can turn around and act as reactants to cause more reaction to take place. This is what we call a chain reaction when the products of one reaction become the reactants, for another reaction. So what happens here is we have one neutron, okay, it strikes it strikes uranium, and out of that we get a speck of dust. Not a speck of dust, but enough energy to move a speck of dust, right? A, a tidbit of energy, we'll call it. Now that also produces three neutrons, which can cause three more reactions, which will move three specks of dust and produce nine neutrons, which moves nine specks of dust. And it'll produce 27 neutrons, which will cause 27 reactions and move 27 specks of dust, and so on and so on and so on. You see how it's growing exponentially, right? In the first generation, we've got enough, we've got one neutron moving a speck of dust. In the second generation, we're moving three specks of dust. In the third generation, we're moving nine. In the fourth, it's 27. In the fifth, it's 81, and so on and so on. This reaction can, if it's done right, can happen so quickly that we can literally cause this vessel that it's contained in to blow itself apart within a fraction of a second. That's what happened in Hiroshima. Okay, I, I think we talked about this one day, right? Did I talk about the, the, the uranium they used in Hiroshima? No? So the Americans built two bombs to drop in Japan in 1945. They built one using in what we call enriched uranium. Um, that's the first one they used. Enriched uranium is, is an isotope of uranium that is very, very rare. When you take naturally occurring uranium, there's a little bit of, an, a little bit of that isotope of uranium in it, but not very much. So you've got to separate it, and that's really difficult to do. It took the Americans about three years to get enough uranium to build the first bomb. It took them, it was so hard to get it, they never actually even tested that bomb. That first bomb they dropped in Hiroshima was never tested. The amount of uranium that they got in three years was 50 kilograms. So they got 50 kilograms of enriched uranium in three years. Now, that, um, that enriched uranium, that 50 kilograms of enriched so this after we're so rudely interrupted by a poem, this 50 kilograms of enriched uranium um, was, was essentially what made up this bomb. Um, but not 50 kilograms didn't explode. They don't know exactly how much exploded. But they figure, they estimate that only between 3 and 5 kilograms of uranium. Think about that between three and five kilograms of uranium actually explode. That's it. The three to five kilograms that exploded was this right here on the left-hand side of the equation. And all of that, like we're talking here, one single, one single uh, nucleus of uranium absorbs a neutron. To get three to five kilograms, that's a lot of nuclei of uranium, right? It's still a small amount of uranium, but it's 
but it's but it's a lot of reactions. It's a lot of a lot of nuclei here. That that bomb exploded three to five kilograms of uranium. It didn't explode the the other forty five kilograms because literally the amount of energy that was produced in exploding that three to five kilograms was so massive that it actually blew the bomb apart before the other 45 kilograms had a chance to explode. And that wasn't a surprise. They, they predicted that. They never tested it, but they 100% predicted that. It was right on target with what they predicted. They needed the other 45 kilograms as part of the design to make sure that the five kilograms would explode. You don't have, 45 kilograms doesn't explode, but if you don't have the 50, the first five doesn't explode either, if that makes sense. All of this happened within a small fraction of a second. So we go from one reaction to three reactions, to nine reactions, to 27, to 81, to 243, and so on and so on and so on, all within a fraction of a second. We go from one enough energy to move one speck of dust to enough energy to blow up a city within a fraction of a second. Make sense? And there's also another term here that you don't really need to know, but you've probably heard it before called critical mass. Do you know what that is? You ever heard that term? In order to sustain a chain reaction, you need a certain minimum amount of fuel to make it happen. You need a certain critical mass. When nuclear weapons are transported from one place to another, it would be by truck or by train. Well, you would hate to keep on that truck with a nuclear bomb on the back of it. Right? Well, it's not such a big deal because it's transported subcritical mass. This means even if it was in a big accident and there was a fire or whatever, it, it, it could not be a nuclear explosion because it's subcritical mass. Does that make sense? So instead of carrying 50 kilograms of uranium, you carry 25 and 25. So the chain reaction could be sustained. So that's nuclear fission. That is. This is the reaction that we used in Hiroshima. Nagasaki was actually plutonium that they used, not uranium, because they didn't have enough uranium left. Left, they used plutonium. The design of this bomb is actually pretty simplistic, actually, but the fuel is really hard to get. The plutonium bomb, uh, the fuel is actually pretty easy to get because it's a byproduct of nuclear reactors. If we produce it in Canada. The byproduct of nuclear reactors. Um, but the design of that bomb is, is quite difficult to, to reproduce, technically, quite difficult to reproduce. So, um, what a, basically, we don't have to worry about terrorists building one of these things, because it's either really hard to get the fuel or it's really hard to get the bomb. Now, the other type of reaction, besides the one that could be used in a bomb and can be used, we forget this sometimes, in a nuclear power plant to generate electricity. The other type of reaction that we're talking about is nuclear fusion. And fusion, well, we can't use that in a nuclear power plant, at least yet. Probably sometime in your lifetime we will be able to. Scientists are working on that. And in the last year or so, they've actually made some pretty good progress on that. But they're still not there yet. Probably in your lifetime, it'll happen. The other place we use nuclear fusion for is, of course, bombs. But we look at, we see this happening. We literally see this one happening every day. We see it happening every day. What am I talking about? Have we said it? The sun. This is the reaction that takes place in the sun. Not this exact fusion reaction, but another fusion reaction taking place in the sun, generating a ton, literally a ton of energy. In a nuclear fusion reaction, we have two light nuclei. Fusing to form one heavy nucleus. So look at what we got here. On the left side, we got two of them 
and on the right side we've got one of them. We've also got a neutron there, which doesn't really come into play so much with this one. We've also got some energy release there as well, just like we do in fission. Funny enough, the energy release in a fusion reaction is actually less than the energy that's released in a fusion reaction. But I'm going to qualify that. We'll put a little asterisk by that because although the energy here is less, it ends up becoming more. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a few moments. How do we make this one happen? We don't fire a neutron at it. We're going to pump energy into this. Less energy that comes out, but we have to pump energy into this. How come? Well, hydrogen is a nucleus that's positively charged, like all nuclei. So you got two positively charged nuclei here. You're pushing them together to cause them to fuse together, right? Getting closer and closer together. You guys learned three units ago that the force between those two nuclei is equal to kq1, q2 over r squared. As r gets smaller, look, as r goes down, f goes exponentially up, right? So that force of repulsion between these nuclei gets bigger and bigger and bigger. These guys do not want to fuse together. So what we have to do is pump a lot of energy, usually in the form of heat, into it to make them fuse together. So we pump energy into it, we make it fuse together, it produces a bigger nucleus, also a neutron, and some more energy, and then some of that extra energy that comes out of it goes into causing more uh, nuclei to fuse together. It's like a chain reaction, except it's not the neutrons acting as the reactants, it's the energy acting as the reactants. How does the sun sustain itself? We don't keep pumping more energy into the sun. How does the sun sustain this reaction? This one's easy. The sun is hot. Right? The sun is hot. Incredibly hot. And it's always generating energy. So a little bit of the energy that it produces always in, goes into causing more hydrogen nuclei to fuse together, producing even more energy and releasing a lot in the process. Obviously. Someday the sun's going to burn out, right? How okay. come? Well, someday you're going to run out of gas. Someday we're going to run out of hydrogen. Um, but probably not going to be in your lifetime. Unless you come up with some kind of immortality way of keeping you alive forever, then that's not going to happen in your lifetime. So nuclear fission is when one lighter, one heavy nucleus becomes two lighter nuclei caused by a neutron sustained by more neutrons. Nuclear fusion is when you have two lighter nuclei fusing together to form one heavy nucleus caused by pumping energy to overcome the repulsive force and sustained by more energy uh, going back to act as a reactor. Remember what we said? I don't know exactly the energy that's released in the fusion reaction, but this energy is actually more than this energy, which is contrary to what people think. But we'll qualify it again in just a few moments here. So that's the difference between fission and nuclear fusion. I want to give you a little table here to describe that energy that we were just talking about, but also something else that's going to surprise you as well. So fission. Fission, remember, is when one heavy becomes two lighter nuclei. Fusion is when two lighter nuclei um, fuse together to form one heavier nucleus. If we're going to rank these, one being high, whoops, let's Use a different color here. One being high and two being low. Then fission will release more energy in a single reaction than will fusion, which is very contrary to what people think. Everybody thinks fusion releases more energy. The sun has fusion, like undergoes fusion. The H-bomb, developed by the Americans in 1952, way more powerful than the atomic bomb developed in 1945 by the Americans. So how can we say that fission releases more than fusion? 
the Lord comparing apples to oranges is just not a fair comparison. And that's what we're doing here. If I've got a smart car with th three liters of fuel, okay, a tiny little smart car has got three liters of fuel in it. They're pretty good on gas, right? Or diesel, I guess they are, aren't they? Like they run on diesel, I think, don't they? Do you have a smart car? Is it, is it gas? Yes, or no? Okay. Okay. Um, so you get pretty good mileage going with this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so if you have a little, have a little smart car with three liters of fuel in it, or if you have, have a big F-350 with 80 liters of fuel in it, which one's going to go for it? Which one's going to go further on the tank of gas? The smart car with three liters or the, or the F-350 with 80 liters? The truck, right? It doesn't mean the truck is better on gas. We're not comparing apples to apples there. That's apples to oranges. It's not a fair comparison. You've got to look at, like, if you say, okay, I got three liters in the smart car, you have to have three liters in the truck to compare, or 80 and 80 to compare it fairly, right? It's not a fair comparison. If I look at just the smart car and the truck with three liters and 80 liters, the truck wins. But it doesn't really mean it's better on gas. I'll also compare apples to apples. Here's the issue here. If I look at fission, it releases more energy in a single reaction. Fusion releases less energy in a single reaction. But why? Well, because fission is like the big F-350, the truck. Look at the amount of fuel. Look at the amount of fuel that's in a single fission reaction. There's 236 nucleons. Protons and neutrons, right? 144 neutrons and, and, and 92 protons. Look at the fuel that's in a fusion reaction. Four nucleons. Of course the, of course the F-350 is going to win, right? It's got so much more fuel in it. It doesn't mean it's better on gas just because it wins in this case. Right? This is the smart car. This is Emma's smart car with only four liters of fuel in it. Of course it's going to lose. If we compare apples to apples and we have a kilogram of each or equal mass of each, right? a kilogram of uranium and a kilogram of hydrogen or 20 kilograms of hydrogen, 20 kilograms of uranium, but equal masses, which one's going to win now? Well, now the smart car is going to win every time, right? In terms of mileage. Right? If you have 20 liters of gas in the smart car, 20 liters of gas in the F-350, the smart car will be more, more efficient, right? It's going to go further. So if we look at per kilogram of fuel or for one kilogram, fusion will win hands down. When we were comparing the single reaction, Yes, fission releases more, but it just isn't fair to compare because there's so much less fuel in a single reaction of fusion. Four nucleons compared to 236. Now, this is the one that's going to surprise you. The bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was a fission bomb. Nagasaki, a fission bomb. Um, Chernobyl. You guys know about Chernobyl, right? You might not know details of it, but the nuclear disaster in, in Ukraine, 1986, I want to say, something around, somewhere around there. That was a fission reaction. Um, Fukushima, Japan. The, remember? You guys remember that one? You guys are old enough to remember that one, probably. Tsunami. What did this uh, nuclear reactor? Caused a meltdown. Maybe, what was that? That would have been a couple of years ago, wouldn't it? 2000, some, I don't know, the last five years sometime. That was a nuclear fusion reaction. In all of those cases, there was a lot of radioactive waste. Even, in, even if we have a, a simple reactor that isn't melting down, there's still a lot of radioactive waste. It's just that we can do something with it, as opposed to in a meltdown, we have a tougher time controlling it. So there's still radioactive waste. The, re the products of a fission reaction are highly radioactive. And as a result, pretty dangerous. 
right? Even if you look at Chernobyl back in the 1980s, we're talking 30 years or so ish. Like Chernobyl, like that whole area around Chernobyl is still a dead zone. Like people can't go back. You can't live there. Like if you look at videos of this, like like people go into apartment buildings and people's supper is still sitting on the table from when they were told to leave. They were told to leave. You're gonna be back on Monday. You gotta be back. You're gonna be gone for the weekend. You don't need to take anything with you because you're gonna be you're gonna be back on Monday. And then they haven't been back since because there's still so much radioactive waste that's that's kicking around there even that many years later. And even in even in uh, Hiroshima. Like it's not nearly to the degree that it was in 1945, but it's still there. It's still radioactive waste. It's highly radioactive. Fusion, on the other hand, the byproducts of nuclear fusion are actually, believe it or not, relatively harmless. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be anywhere close to a fusion reaction. If we're talking about a fusion bomb versus a fusion bomb, I don't want to be close to either one of them. But you can be closer to a fusion bomb than a fusion bomb because the explosion would be less. But the fallout would be more. You can come back to an area that was bombed by a fusion bomb sooner than you can come back to an area that was bombed by a fusion bomb. Hiroshima would be destroyed by a fusion bomb, but it would be perfectly safe now. There wouldn't be any trace, really, any trace of radioactivity now, like there was, like there is as a result of the fission bomb that was dropped. Does that make sense? I don't know how I'm going to ask you these questions on uh, on the test next Wednesday because all you got to do is, is find it. But um, remember, final exam day. You gotta remember this stuff, right? Alright, we'll wrap it up there for today.